needs to hear us. No one needs to hear us doing our vocal warm ups. Hi, Dave. <laughs> Hi, Sandy. Oh, how embarrassing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Talking about our warm up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Woo. Okay. What are we talking about today? It's <laughs> a good question. We are talking about planning and support in a coaching session. And this episode is a part of our series on the different parts of a coaching session. So be sure to check out the previous three episodes, starting a session, setting the agreement slash agenda, and evoking awareness. But yeah, so for today, planning and support. So what do we mean when we say planning and the support? and support in the context of a coaching conversation? Well, in the ICF competencies, number eight is facilitates client growth. And here are the three markers that speak to it. So 8.5 says coach partners with the client to design post session thinking, reflection, or action. 8.6 says coach partners with the client to consider how to move forward, including resources, support, and potential barriers. 8.7 says, coach partners with the client to design the best methods of accountability for themselves. Yeah, and the National Board, uh, their practical skills assessment guidelines, they have a few competencies that also cover this part of a coaching conversation, namely competencies L, which is short term goal setting. And I just want to say these are competencies from 2021 22. So things may have changed if you're listening to this and they've changed things. But right now it's competency L, short-term goal setting, competency M, progress monitoring or accountability, and competency N, anticipating challenges. And most, if not all, ICF and National Board accredited coach training schools, they require students to submit a 30-minute recording of a coaching session. And we'll talk about this. We love those 30-minute sessions. <laughs> Dave's rolling his eyes for those of you listening. But we'll talk about those sessions towards the end of this episode and also how planning and support come into play in our own sessions and what, what we do in our sessions. So before we get into discussing this, let's talk about transitioning to this part of the coaching conversation. How does a coach even know when it's time to move into the planning portion of the evening hmm. or day? Yeah, obviously, we're assuming that the coach has nailed the agenda, and we've talked about that in the previous uh, uh, recording. We know that the client, we know what the client wants out of the session, explored what is what else is necessary to explore, and have maximum assurance that this is what really what the client wants out of today's session. If any of this is uncertain, it could lead a coach to co-design with the client something that doesn't address the real problem or the thing beneath the thing, something that the client is not really willing to do or something that the client will not sustain because they realize it really didn't solve the root problem that they came to the session for. So make sure you're both clear and certain on that agenda before you get into planning and support. Yeah, the agenda, again, super clear. And you can go back to that, that episode on, on the agenda and agreement and hear all of our opinions <laughs> and thoughts, which you know are so important. Always. But always, but yeah, okay. So say we get to the agenda. We've done a bunch of evoking awareness, and you can check out previous episode, episode seven on that. And I want to add, like, after evoking awareness, sometimes there is a natural pause or a shift in the conversation. And this is a great time to ask what's coming forward for you, if anything. And it might give insight into what the client wants to do in terms of an action step or a plan moving forward. And then you could ask a follow up. Is there something that they would like to work on over the next week? So you you move into planning from there. Um, OK, so so we figured out what we're working on. What we are moving towards in terms of a plan, we're having a nice conversation. So what's next? Yeah, so first, it could be the need for more evoking. <laughs> evoking returns yet again into the coaching conversation. Um, what do they know already? You know, what areas or categories would be a best resolution found for them? Help them narrow these areas of possible resolutions so that they can maximize discovery of a resonant solution. Um, more discovery, maybe brainstorming, something in their past to re-engage with offer something from our own toolbox. But here, you know, we always got to watch out for 
coach led suggestions of solutions. Um, we like to joke about meditation bullying. So don't offer meditation to everything. It's not the <laughs> catch all solution for everything. Or journaling. <laughs> or journaling. Yeah. Although they both work, they have their yeah, moments. They're great, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. But not all the time. Um, and remember that it need not be an action, which to me implies something external or physical they must do. It could be something internal like reflection or just sitting in with it for a while if a shift has happened in their thinking or emotions. Yeah, I'm glad we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. And, you know, if you do a lot of evoking in a session, sometimes for me, like my clients are like, stick a fork in me, I'm done. And, and the action step is to just process the session. They're like, I need to go think or take a nap or like <laughs> walk around the block. It might be enough. So, so pushing towards action, I'm using air quotes here might not be the best thing. And then I use the word pushing and that, that implies that the coach is leading as well. So we definitely don't want that. Yeah, exactly. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this action emotion thing, but yeah, uh, I get a lot of clients too, who just say, give me the tool. Right. It's like, right. And <laughs> I'm going to joke a little about habit gurus out there, but man, with that industry out there, everybody thinks there's a habit to be done or a tool to be done. If you, if I just stick another thing in my calendar, that's going to be it. And it might be it, right? but, um, but sometimes it's not, it's something mm -hmm. potentially they need to just take a walk around the block with that could be just mm -hmm. enough, um, right. for that. Right. So that after we get something like that created, um, we usually need to check resonance for that proposed solution. So you ever have a client with you, with whom you might've co-designed something, but then you just didn't quite feel it, you know, after you created it. Yeah. I, yes, I'm laughing. I'm thinking of a particular client and I even, I mean, it's not important. The story's not important. It's not important what the details were of the coaching conversation, but it was, it was, there was a lot of internal work going on for this client. And when it came to planning and support, I asked her, you know, what's coming forward is something you want to, you want to work on or think about, take forward into the next week. And she went straight to action and she went straight to doing. And she was like, I think I'm want to, you know, let's say it was about meal planning, you know, plan meals for the next five days. <laughs> it was like, and she and her voice literally trailed off. And she kind of she shied away a little bit. This was on zoom. So she was like moving away from the computer. And I was like, Yeah, no, you're not gonna do that. <laughs> and this is this is a client I have good rapport with I've known her a long time and I called her on it. And she was like, You're right. I no. And it was too much. It was too much to move into action. But yeah, I felt I felt that um, dissonance between her words and, and the energy she was she was projecting for sure. Yeah, that's a great example. It also calls to mind um, when the client runs away from the internal solution, you can see where they went from ah, I didn't really not sure I want to do that. So I'm going to go propose something more Right. physical external so we'll probably can talk more about that uh, at a future podcast but um mm -hmm. yeah trying to figure out how to bring them back to really the solution that they need which is in this case an internal one but not letting them run away to the external one because they don't want to face the internal one <laughs> right right face the music and dance yeah so yeah. um yeah how would you check for resonance what yeah you mentioned ways? resonance um that you can think resonance that yeah go ahead no i was saying how, how might you check for resonance that's what you said well what are yeah. some of the ways that you might think of yeah yeah well i i'm i mentioned above energy and also knowing your client you know i've talked about this with students clients have have tells you know habits ticks get to know those they are they are very telling okay. um to watch their energy i and we should be watching energy in the en entire session, of course. So don't stop now. <laughs> Isn't that a queen song or something? Um, but yeah, are they excited? Are they like gesticulating? Like, this is what I'm going to do. I have open arms right now for those of you listening, like kind of sitting up taller. Um, 
or maybe they're like shifting in their chair and kind of collapsing. So, so watching energy, watching body language, if you are able to see the person, for me is, is really important. Um, and I want to add, be sure this goes back to, you know, sort of meditation bullying and coach leading the client, make sure that your client isn't just going along with whatever you're saying. So we are not there to have our ego stroked. It's not about us. And we'll probably have an episode about that at some point, but be mindful of leading language. So, you know, if you say something like, well, what are your thoughts on starting a meditation practice? I mean, yeah, that's an open-ended question, but it's still a little, little leading, but anyway, sidebar. So how do you tell if a client is on board with the plan that was just created, Dave? Yeah, a lot of great things you just said there. Uh, it actually <laughs> created this image of me of a, a poker game, right? Because you're trying yeah. to watch the tells, right? Uh, but then I was envisioning as you were talking that they were filled with a bunch of peach people pleasers. <laughs> so imagine playing <laughs> poker <laughs> with a bunch of people pleasers and you got to watch out for what they're holding in their hands. And also they might be agreeing with you simply because of something you because of the cards you put down, I don't know, something like that's that. a great point. And and some clients are people pleasers. It's just their natural tendency. It's nothing wrong with that. People pleasers can be great, you know, mediators, judges. Like mm -hmm. they they see that balance, but they also like they want everything to be okay. And and that might might affect what they get out of the session. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Um, but you, for me, it's usually an energy and intuitive thing for me. Um, sometimes the energy is obvious. Like as you said in your examples, right? The client exhibits excitement towards the resolution. And you can see how they just want to do it. You note that it's not faked as in people pleasing or some other thing, but they, that the energy is real and it's truly come from, coming from the heart. Most of the time you can kind of tell it's something's faked. Um, and that's usually for our benefit as coaches and not their own. So go watch for that. Uh, and related to the energy is the intuitive component because you're sensing that energy. Um, but oftentimes you can sense what the client will want to work on uh, alongside that energy. If you've worked on intuition and coaching, you'll often know what's going on inside the client, what they want, what seems to be a viable solution as you move through the session, as you're kind of sensing what's coming from them. So it's something that is really worthwhile to, to work on in your coaching skills. And well, if they don't seem to have the energy or your intuition is telling you something isn't quite right, you gotta inquire, you gotta go and figure out what's going on. Something like, hey, I'm sensing low energy or not that much excitement from you regarding this resolution. What's behind that? Or I'm not feeling you're totally bought into what we've designed here. What are your thoughts on that? And so really getting into, into that and figuring out you know, why whatever you came up with, they're just not into it, right? You're not feeling it and neither are they quite mm -hmm. frankly either. All right. Yeah. Well, let's say we have made sure that the proposed solution works and resonates with them. What's next? Yeah. So it's then time to get specific with the details of whatever they are choosing to move forward on. And, you know, you've all heard of SMART goals, SMART being the acronym for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. Yes, I have that written down because I never remember it. <laughs> I know, I'm such a bad coach. Um, if it's something non-tangible, um, you know, maybe you invite them to use a bodily sensation or somatics or working on something to notice or notice shifting or work on shifting. Um, self-observation, self-reflection, these can be action steps too, even though they're not like active, active. I don't know, word action steps doesn't really resonate with me, but what what else comes forward for you when we talk about getting into the details of, of planning an action step? Yeah, as we spoke about earlier, um, remember it need not be a true action, which implies something external or physical they must do. It could be right. something internal, like reflection, as you said, uh, sitting with it for a while, if some shift has happened, all that's totally fine. Um, we talked a little bit about how action can be misleading. Right? It can imply that this is something they need to do externally, physically, but and in many cases, that's true. Then 
if that is the case, you can just get into what is the, the need to do to solve the problem. So inquire about the details, what it looks like, how often, what's the actual activity, all that and more. You can set up ways to measure it, like how it's working for them, which is often very motivating in itself. So we want to make sure that they can feel the difference between before and after. Um, and sometimes setting up rewards can be really helpful here too. Um, an example would be creating structure around their calendar. So what kind of calendar works best for them? What would help them, what would help them keep to and not skip the calendar alerts? How might the calendar be best arranged and so on? But what would a SMART goal look, for, look like for something internal or emotional? It can still be very similar, but just takes a different kind of inquiry. The questions you would ask would likely be reflective, asking a person to feel more, see what is going on inside their minds and bodies. Often this can be really difficult for both the coach and the client. So the coach would likely benefit from specific training and practice, you know, in this area, working with highly emotional clients, like with mentor sessions. The client's going to have to have the ability to sense internally before these can happen really well. But if they can't, then the coach would really need to develop the skill to bring these out in clients who have a lowered ability to sense inside themselves. Yeah, and this is a great point because I, I see new coaches, they don't know what to do with that with emotions. They don't know what to do with the internal stuff. And it's it, these are skills that can be developed. Um, we all have to start somewhere. And this is why many new coaches and coaching sessions are very transactional, where the action steps are external, physical, in the environment instead of internal, because it is, it, it's a new way of, of thinking, of speaking to the client, and, and a new way of, you have to learn how to guide them in a way, and I hesitate using the word guide because um, we don't want to lead our clients. But within the structure of a coaching conversation, there there are techniques and, and skills that can be practiced so you feel more comfortable coaching around the internal internal aspects. Yeah, absolutely, great skills to to learn, and you'll grow as a coach um, doing it for sure. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, SMART can still be applied to whatever emerges. So, for example, if it was some deeper ex examination of emotions surfaced as the agenda, we might come to a solution of journaling, as we've talked about before. Uh, but we want to clarify what kind of journaling, when they should they journal, what should they be journaling about, how often should they be journaling, all that. If the solution is also internal, then what will they do internally with whatever it is that they will resolve the issue? Is it reflection? Is it something else? If so, what will they create with that reflection? How can they measure if this reflective work is working? And so on, things like that. Yeah, and the, the scaling, um, the scaling question, which we all learn on a scale of one to 10, you know, that, that might be a good thing to, to implement here to bring up. So if, if you know, you want to work on that reflective practice of feeling, feeling a certain way, it's like, okay, well, scale of one to 10, where are you? How do you feel now? Like, and where do you want to be next week? Like, so there's, there's ways to measure, measure the non tangible goals and action steps. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So let's talk accountability. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm laughing. I don't know why I'm this word <laughs> this word just doesn't resonate with me either. And and I don't know why. And yes, I've been coached on this and uh, I brought it up in a group coaching session last year and we had a really interesting conversation about it. It was pretty cool. Um but uh yeah, so many clients they want to check in with the coach. Um which is fine. They want to be accountable to the coach. No, okay. I I invite you to ask your clients how they're going to be self-sufficient when you are not there so get them thinking about how to be internally motivated accountable to the self we are not personal assistants that are only there to help them keep their schedule <laughs> coaching is much more than that so this is fine i mean it's fine it's fine but if it's a pattern yeah i would ask the client so when i'm not here in six months how will you be accountable to yourself and yeah, that word accountability, um, in that session I mentioned, that group coaching session, we, we talked about other words for accountability. So sometimes I say, how, how would you like to stay on track? 
Or how would you like to stay true to yourself with accomplishing this goal of X, Y, Z? Or maybe how do you want to be responsible for this? And we had a mentor who used the word support instead of accountability. And I really like that. Um, but many people think support is is different than accountability. So what are your thoughts on this, Dave? Are they the same or are they different? Hmm. Support versus accountability. To me, they're similar, but also very different too. Um, some people could be asking for a coach accountability as part of the of our coaching process. Is that support? Or is that us bugging them every morning with a text asking if they did their daily homework or not? Right. Not that there's anything wrong with that. It may actually be part of the coaching service that you provide uh, to make sure that they are on track. Support in this area could also mean that we're helping the client achieve their own accountability. Generally, we coaches, as you said, want to work towards clients being accountable to themselves. To be honest, I haven't had any achieved self-accountability, unfortunately. It seems to require a lot of time and effort to explore the accountability piece itself, let alone what's coming up in the agenda. Um, I will say that I've had many realize that the quote unquote need for accountability has magically disappeared. <laughs> once the problem they figured out, <laughs> once they figured out that the, what the underlying motivations to do something was, uh, or feel a certain way, then accountability becomes easy. Right. When you truly want to do something or feel a certain way, so we could probably go on a rant about what happened with all the habit books and the gurus saying you need accountability you gotta keep tracking things on a on a scorecard and a dashboard or gamify it blah 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 we can probably leave that for another podcast but um yeah that's one way to get self accountability is when they cannot resist going towards the thing you design with them for the agenda right it's like they just want to do it naturally that's like the yeah. best kind yeah, and that goes back to like, what is their energy? Are they really feeling it? If they're not, yeah, that accountability question might be really important to help them at first. Okay, so now we have a goal or action step neatly planned out, some detail. So what's next? Okay, now we can get into risk mitigation. So these would things like, what would prevent you from doing the solution? What else might you need to help you do the solution? What barriers are coming up for you as you reflect on this? Uh, and so on. Simply going through possible problems that may come up can produce some confidence that they will get through them, if not already having the potential solution in mind from the session. Yeah, and, and this is so important. So asking, you know, what could get in your way of accomplishing X, Y, Z? And I review a lot of student sessions where that question is asked. It's competency for national board, um, practical skills assessment. So that's only half of it. <laughs> when they say this could get in the way, then it's like, so what happens? If that happens, what do you do then? So you brainstorm possible solutions to help them sort of proactively plan again, a plan within a plan to help them figure out what happens when those challenges do arrive. So it's a two-parter and it's really important. Yeah, definitely so. Yeah. So after risk mitigation, we have the support questions. What might those look like? Yeah, so I, I always ask what would support, I mean, easy peasy, what would support you in accomplishing your goal of X, Y, Z? And I, I, I've, I'm saying X, Y, Z a lot because we like to use the language to keep the client on track. Um, you might say, what will support you? It's like, in what? You know, I, I actually had a client ask that. They're like, what? And I'm like, okay, in accomplishing X, Y, Z. <laughs> you know, yeah, use, use their words, use the, use the agenda, use the goal words. Um, but I, I asked what would support you in this goal and, and support can be anything. So people, places, pets, environments, I mean, support can truly be anything. What are your thoughts on that? What questions do you ask? It's pretty simple, usually. Uh, like you said, just asking something like, what else might you need for supporting you towards your goal? 
what other support might you need? You could ask a general question. Oh, there's dangers potentially with people not understanding exactly what do you mean by that? Uh, what else might be helpful for you to achieve your goal today? And what else can we say about support and planning? Well, would this be a good place to talk about that dreaded 30 minute session? <laughs> you knew I was going there eventually. Um, so, so, yeah, so what are, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? So you have a time constraint, 30 minutes, either when you're, you know, a student that needs to turn in that 30 minute session for ICF for national board, um, certification for the coach training course year, or you're working for a coaching company as, as you and I do. And, and that's the time that you're given to coach. It's there are 30 minute sessions. So yeah. What, what do you do in terms of planning and support when you have this time constraint? And then, and then I'll add my two cents in a minute. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's see a few thoughts to offer up. If your flow through the session is going well, you'll probably hit planning somewhere between 10 to 20 minutes left in the session. Probably the bulk of them will have you hit planning somewhere towards the second half. If this happens, you'll likely have more than enough time to go through planning support before you need to close the session. If you somehow need to go back to redo the agenda, then things can get muddy pretty quickly. Uh, but don't get stressed or nervous. Just keep going to get as much planning support done before closing. It may only take a single question on risk mitigation and one question on support, and then you're done. If you're really pressed for time, then you can just ask the question to summarize what they've gained in the session. These could be, what have you learned today? What are your takeaways? What insight have you gained today? What is one thing you will move towards uh, after today's session? Um, something just to kind of tie it up and give them something uh, to reflect on after the session. But, you know, in this 30 minute world of coaching for if you're doing it with one of the big coaching providers, corporations, you may even consider tabling discussion for the day and continuing it at the next session. Clients are often very flexible about this because, well, first, they don't really know what coaching is. <laughs> they don't know what how coaching really needs to go. Um, but um, they're pretty smart, too. Right? They can usually feel like, you know what, 30 minutes is too short of a time. And I go, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So let's continue this at the next session, which uh, often everybody's OK with. And so why? stress and try to fit in in the last 30 seconds uh, planning support and closure of oh. <laughs> right 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 and i want to add one of the one of the platforms we both work for they they use their own video platform as well and i love this about the platform i don't love a lot about the platform because it's very glitchy but the one thing is there's a little clock in the corner and then it it comes up there's a little white box that says five minutes remaining in the session you see it the client sees it and we're both like, OK. <laughs> and I said, we have five minutes left. They're like, yeah. So they know. And at that point, for me, usually, no matter where we are, I will ask, what do you want to take forward? What do you want to work on? I ask those support questions. I mean, it, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. But I, I do love that that one uh, platform keeps track of the time for you. It's like one less thing to think about in those, in those sessions. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Good. I'm also on the same platform, but we actually use Zoom instead. Uh, yeah, maybe I need to buy a clock to put right about here. <laughs> maybe I need to do that. Camera. I don't know. That's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, nice technical solution. Um, yeah. One of the few that are actually working probably. Yeah. And I, I'll i mention this, the student sessions here. Um, so I, I hear a lot of sessions where there's a lot of evoking, expanding, and it's like, okay, you know, we're, it's great, <laughs> but then we need to move into planning. Like if you're trying to, to, to show, demonstrate those competencies, you need to move into planning. So if there's a shift, I mentioned a shift earlier, that sometimes happens where a client is like, oh, okay. That's what's going on. That's that's your cue to be like, what's shifting for you? And is there something, you know, don't stack your questions, but and is there something, follow up question, is there something you want to work on? And move into planning, maybe 10 minutes left in the session. I mean, 
seven or eight minutes if you really want to give it some time. Um, but listen for that shift. And if it doesn't happen, which it sometimes doesn't, just keep your eye on the clock and then just take a pause and say, you don't even have to say I'm conscious of the time because it's the client doesn't care about the time, but just say, I just want to check in, you know, how are we doing? Maybe restate the agenda. We were here, now we're here. The client answers. And then what are your thoughts on, on figuring out a plan for you to, to work on over the coming weeks? So. Yeah, I think a lot of people stress over this last part, but it can happen very quickly. It's you know, This is the easy part, people. <laughs> yeah, it totally is, right? You know, what support yeah. you might, what prevent, what might prevent you, what support you might you need and boom, you're done, right? It's like, yeah, exactly. often that's all you need because if mm -hmm. you did a really well-designed co-created resolution, it's possible that those are very minimal, right? Or potentially like, no, I got this, right? It's like, I, I'm going to do it, right? It's like, that's what you'll get from the client. They'll be so engaged and enthused to, to go do it that all the other stuff, nothing's going to prevent me. It's like, I don't need any support. I got this, right? It's like, Right. Well, there's that. And there's also like, if, if you, sorry, I totally interrupted. How rude. It's okay. You can interrupt. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say, I'll, I'll go back and say, if, if the evoking part was done well, he yeah. won't need that much time for planning because things will be like, okay, this is what I need to work on and I'm going to do it. And then that excitement, like you said, should be present. Hopefully. Yep. Absolutely. Hopefully. Let's see. Well, shall we talk about what we do in terms of this stage of the coaching conversation? You want to go first? Yeah, sure. So already mentioned a lot of what I do, um, but here, here are the questions I ask when I move into this, this part of the conversation. Is there something coming forward you'd like to work on over the next week, or is there something you want to take forward with you to think about? And if it's a tangible plan, I help them get smart. Um, again, even if it's non-tangible, you know, like I want to work on my confidence in the workplace, you could still get specific as we talked about earlier. What in particular do you want to do to help with that confidence? And it may be, again, just to observe the self, to notice what happens when confidence is lagging. And noticing can be a very powerful action step. And yeah and we mentioned earlier maybe they just need time to process everything that's come up in the session and that's fine don't be a plan pusher bully a goal bully <laughs> don't do it but regardless of what the plan is i then ask what will support you with this goal of xyz again people places pets environments invite them to really think about this people don't think about support support's important i ask what could get in your way and then what happens when that happens? Um, so prevention or in the moment problem solving of those challenges, help them imagine what could go astray and how to solve those problems before or as they arise. And then what will help you stay on track in accomplishing X, Y, Z. So that's accountability. And then the final question I ask is what else, if anything needs to be considered here? So this is just a very open question I might, I'm going to rewind, I'm going to rewind. What else, if anything, might be considered here in terms of this goal X, Y, Z? Because if you don't put that on, they could be like, well, actually, I had a fight with my partner. And then you're in another coaching conversation, which is like, okay, poorly worded, Swanson, keep it tight. <laughs> you don't want to expand here. You want to keep it tight. So, yeah, so, or, or if I, as the coach, am noticing something at this point, um, I'll point it out, you know, so last week you said you're going to be really busy the next few weeks with work. So what comes up for you when you think about this new exer exercise plan you want to start? Like, oh, yeah, so, you know, you as the coach can can challenge them as well here, but keep it on track. So you'll notice there's a lot of questions here at the end. It might feel like the third degree to the coach, but I promise at this point, it does not. This is just like boom, 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 getting it tight, getting it clear. I, I invite new coaches to not do the third degree when evoking, <laughs> because if you're doing a lot of internal type questions, motivation questions, trying to get, you know, get at what's underneath, 
that that can feel like the third degree to a client. So so use those reflections further up in the conversation. Um, but yeah, when we're on the clock and evoking was done well, these questions should come pretty quickly, pretty easily. And it should not take that much time. So what about you? What do you do in terms of planning and support? Great stuff, Sandy. I mean, it's so complete. Um, I'm going to study everything you said there. <laughs> There's some great stuff in there. Uh, my planning support is pretty similar. Um, as mentioned before, it could just be like one question for planning, one, one question for support, and then you're done. Uh, I would say that flexibility here is pretty crucial because you may have clients come up with a ton of different types of, of resolutions. One client might be trying to get their life organized more balanced. You can help them get into the mechanics of what's considered the scheduling, the effort mindset, you know, help them mitigate risk um, from many different directions as a thought partner. Another client might be trying to resolve their sadness around losing their mother recently. Then it may be asking gently, what might they need to help them ease their sadness right now? And then designing from what comes out of that exploration. Find that in our heavily thought-based world, it's so much easier for us to work on things that are mechanical. Right? Hence our love fest with habit techniques and making something as small as possible so you can, there's no way you can actually do that tiny little thing right? or fail at it. But when it comes to emotional, internal things, it can quickly become unfamiliar and uncomfortable uh, as to how to navigate the successful creation of a resolution for a client. Yeah, yeah, beautifully said, beautifully said. Thanks. Uh, what else? Any final thoughts? Well, I would just offer to new coaches um, to not get mired in planning. Planning should not take a long time. I've said that three times now, I think. <laughs> it should not take a long time if evoking was done properly. I have listened to sessions where it's like there's no evoking and it's all planning. And it's like, you're the personal assistant here. You're not a coach. So don't get mired, you know, listen for that shift. If there's no shift in the conversation while you're evoking, just take a pause, take a second, check in, invite them to help co-create a plan and then move forward. Anything else? I don't think so. Stay tuned for a final episode in this series on closing the session. <laughs> yeah. Exciting. And we'll leave some resources in the show notes, as always. Where can people find you, Sandy? Swansoncoaching.com. What about you? Where can people find you? CoachDshen.com. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye-bye.